Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining me. And on tonight's program, Julia Lee of Berman Invest tells us whether it's the right time to start accumulating tech stocks and are mining stocks on their last legs. Then June Baylou of Tribeca Alpha Plus is asked to look at the same questions and she nominates three or four stocks she really likes right now. And then finally, Paul Rickard looks at the claim that a recession is brewing. Now, the bond market is actually giving off those kinds of messages, but Paul asks the question and answers the question about whether you can really trust the bond market on this subject. So that's the show. Let's kick off with Julia Lee of Berman Invest. Thanks for joining us, Julia. Great to be here, Pete. Uh, now, Julia, last week we, we saw that, you know, occasionally uh, tech stocks had a bit of a run and then they came back a little bit. Do you think we're seeing a bit of a sneak preview of what eventually will happen for tech stocks? If it's not end of this year, maybe 2023? Yeah, look, I think tech is still an attractive growth area. It's just that we need to get over the hump around the concern around interest rates. And the reason why interest rates are rising is inflation. So if you want to combat inflation, you want to combat those businesses so they're growing faster than inflation. And the tech sector, there's lots of companies like that. In a rising interest rate environment, though, you want to avoid the speculative end of the market. So you really want to move with the more profitable companies in terms of, of the move, because um, we know that on down days, the moves can be quite big. But look, I think the tech space looks here. Also importantly, you know, China has introduced some measures to help um, sentiment around technology stocks. Um, one of the things they said that was that they would be supporting uh, stock asset prices. So that's put a bit of a floor under Chinese stocks. And of course, Chinese tech stocks have been very much in focus in the US um, and in trouble with the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission over there. But uh, China has been talking about perhaps opening the books on its tech stocks, which would help it get out of trouble with the SEC and which would mean that those Chinese companies wouldn't be de delisted from trading in the US mm -hmm. um, on the US exchange. And that would be a positive for sentiment in terms of tech stocks. So watching that very carefully, that news came out today. And we're watching to see if we see a bit of a release valve in terms of the tension between Chinese tech stocks and the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission in the US. And that too, I think, will be positive for sentiment. Yeah. Julia, um, just for those people who might not have seen you in the, in the past or recently, you know, have you added any tech stocks to your portfolio? Um, I guess having a look at zero share price, and it, it does look undervalued at the moment. Um, it's still growing uh, relatively attractively. So zero, I think, is a buy under $100. I think uh, WiseTech has always looked relatively interesting given the logistical challenges. Um, I think that, you know, that people who are and companies that are struggling with logistics would look for platforms like WiseTech to help. Um, and look, Square also outperformed in terms of its last quarterly update as well. Square just watching a uh, strategy day that's coming up in May for more of an update because they didn't give full year guidance. So it'll be interesting to see how its business is evolving because it's really evolving into almost a neighborhood of products where, you know, we might see artists using Square um, in terms of the payment system, that money goes into cash where it has a cash app, and then you've got the debit card that you can use. So you almost don't have to even leave the Square infrastructure. So it'll be interesting to get an update on that. We know the buy pay later space is a tough space, it looks like that's also by some of the other positive aspects of Square. Yeah, of course, Square, of course, has Afterpay, and they're under the name of Block nowadays, aren't they? Yes, yeah, so it's the old Afterpay. It was taken over by a massive US giant, so it's not really just buy now, pay later, mm. but it's much bigger than that. So it's all about the payment space. And you may have seen, you know, the little square when you go to pay and you tap. It's a US giant, which is expanding globally yeah. as well. Okay. Let's talk about the mining sector now because you've, you've been a fan of mining and it's worked out nicely for you. Um, and I get the questions all the time, Julia, you know, is it too late to buy lithium? Uh, and, and I say, well, you know, in the short term it might be, but in the long term I suspect the really good quality companies will keep going higher. What, do you agree with that analysis? Yeah, look, I think that's a really good question. 
Yeah, I think one of the things that I, I've learned throughout the decades is that things go on a lot longer than you expect in terms of the markets. When you're looking at the commodity cycle, things not only go a lot longer than you usually think, but they get a lot crazier in terms of pricing as well. And look, the pricing side of things really comes when there's an imbalance between demand and supply. And the rapid movement towards electric vehicles, zero carbonisation, means that demand at the moment is so strong and supply just can't keep up. So we're seeing a record price in terms of lithium prices, lithium carbonate prices. We're also seeing battery material pricing doing very well. At some stage, the party will stop. But my general rule of thumb is that you start selling when you see a supply response. Because at the end of the day, Pete, you know, things aren't difficult to dig out of the ground. It just takes a lot of time to get the mine up and producing. So it's really just a matter of time till there's enough battery materials to help to um, meet demand. So usually when there's a big supply response, that's when I start uh, lightening up on my positioning um, and really just having a look at that supply versus demand balance. The good news for investors in lithium is that in 2022, looks like lithium pricing is going to remain really strong. So for those producers that are producing like Orchem, Pilgrim Minerals, they are renegotiating their contracts at great prices and it looks like it's going to be a, a knockout year. And do you like those two companies, Pilbara and Orchem? I do. I like Orchem as well as Pilbara. I'm a little bit more cautious um, companies that are developing mines because we know that there are labour shortages at the moment. We know the material costs have been rising. So building anything is becoming more and more expensive. So we're likely to hear, I think, of capital expenditure blowouts. But if you're producing right now, when prices are at record highs, I think you're in a great position. It's not just lithium that I like. You know, Pete, I like rare earths as mm. well. And today, Aluka came out with a great announcement that their facility for rare earths had been approved. Um, my favourite in this space is Linus, and that's because it's already up and producing. And look, in terms of, of rare earths, you know, they are relatively toxic. So I think um, it's it's not going to be smooth sailing trying to get a new facility up and running. And as I mentioned, those construction costs, I think, are just going to keep on rising, especially if you're trying to get something operational um, by 2023 or the second half of 2022. So my preference is for Linus in the space. And of course, you know, I like Institute Pivot. Um, fertilizer prices still at record highs. So right, just writing that up. Uh, fertilizer okay what, what you got to do promise us julie when you start getting nervy about those stocks you gotta let us know all right because you're a momentum lady okay i will too i have started to sell a little bit of the wood side mm. um so about a third of the holdings there around the 120 price mm. of course oil prices are just at 100 us barrel at yeah. the moment yeah i've lightened my wood side as well good good to talk to you julia talk to you next week Chef. thanks pete Well, joining us now is June Bay Lu of Tribeca Alpha Plus. Uh, great to see you, June Bay. Joining me now is June Bay Lu of Tribeca Alpha Plus. Great to see you, June Bay Lu. Great to see you, Peter. How are you? Very good. Very good. Now, over the last few weeks, we've seen a few, if you like, flash in the pan um, increases for tech share prices. And I'm wondering whether what we're seeing is a sneak preview of, of a, a more sustained support for tech stocks sometime later this year. What do you think? Mm, I like to think so. However, um, the best performers, if you look around the world, so obviously NASDAQ uh, led the rally, really. Uh, if you look at uh, analyze across the flow of what tech company, what sort of tech company has really outperformed, um, unfortunately, it's actually the most shorted tech company uh, rather than the, you know, the big quality tech company that has, you know, long only manager or, you know, um, you know, long term investors pile in. So uh, what that suggests is that in the last few weeks, what we saw was really Degrossing, so hedge fund selling their winners and buying back some of the, um, you know, buying back some of the uh, shorter names that they have done really well. So, um, so that's what we saw. But of course, normally what that does is the next leg is the retail investors start buying, and then after that, it could then trigger um, the actual institutional long only managers start again.
get into the market. Mm. So it's all a good sign, but we uh, we haven't got too excited yet. Um, no. But potentially, it can lead to a more sustained rally. Why would a hedge fund manager buy stocks that they had been shorting? What would what would be their thinking? So their thinking is essentially they they are a little bit worried about um, you know what is to come. World, given at the beginning of March we have you know Russia actually really Russia really moved into Ukraine. Uh, we are seeing a spike in risk, and hedge fund managers are uh, are those people are very very conservative. So they have made lots of money out of. Uh, buying resources company uh, and shorting tech companies uh, in the last six months. So what yep. they have done is that essentially take some money off the table by selling their winners um, and then buying back some of the shorts that they have in the tech space. So essentially take money off the table. So when I use the suggestion that are we seeing a sneak preview of what might happen down the track for tech stocks overall, I, I presume the hedge fund managers believe that eventually there will be a rotation back into tech stocks. I presume <coughs> when growth is so strong, we stop worrying about interest rate rises? Yeah, look, I think it does, it does suggest that. I think the growth uh, growth, uh, growth sector, the growth companies, mm. uh, some of them has just been sold way too much. So mm. hedge fund managers taking some, um, you know, take, banking in some of their winnings. Um, and then if you're looking forward ahead, that yes, the bond yield is going higher, yeah, valuation is still being challenged. But, um, you know, for some of those structural leaders, um, we, uh, you know, the portfolio will have to have them, um, mm. you know, if we take a two, three years view, especially if the growth outlook on a two-year view is deteriorating on a global basis. Yeah, because I, I must admit, I, I always, I know, we, we know payment companies and tech companies have copped it. And I, I must admit, I, I've often looked at PayPal, which was a $307 stock or something, went down to about 100. That seems to me to be a massive sell-off of a, of a quality company. Is that a fair analysis? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And there are so many examples you can use, um, the likes of uh, Zoom, for example. Mm. Uh, you know, the share price went briefly uh, below the pre-pandemic levels. Um, if anything, you know, we all of us have ne who have never heard of Zoom before now use Zoom on a daily basis. That's so right. in fact, we're on a Zoom now. Um, so, you know, Zoom as a company is definitely structurally better and the growth going forward. Um, yes, we'll go, go back a little bit because the pandemic's now is over. Well, not over, it's become endemic but still the company is far more valuable than what it was before pandemic so you know a lot of those examples exist and it requires investors to be patient um, and really just take a longer term view and um, you know buy company on the, those quality companies on those bases yeah um, mining stocks are, are they still going to be popular for some time yet yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, 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 normally, um, you know, when the world returns to growth, the mining stocks is a place to be because uh, there's a lot more requirement of the commodity and the like. Um, and this cycle is a little bit unique as well. Um, rather than just demand, it's actually supply side that there's a lot of constraint as well because of the pandemic and as well as uh, this, the disruption, supply side disruption caused by also, um, you know, the, the, the conflict in Europe. So um, all of that together certainly seems that the commodity uh, prices will remain elevated and the commodity companies um, seems very attractive at this point given the amount of free cash flow they're generating at this point. Yeah, so are you saying for people who are maybe have made some good money out of the likes of BHP and Rio and even the lithium stocks as well, um, it's worth holding for some time? Yeah, there's more to go, absolutely. Hmm. Okay, good. What what miners have you held with great glee? Oh look, we have we have the likes of the uh, Fortescue, the likes of uh, the BHP. Uh, Fortescue really last year we got too cheap. Um, you know, everyone everyone's mm. worried about the outlook for iron ore and things. Um, so we took a position and we've done well out of that. We're still holding a BHP, and then of course the most attractive out of all commodity space is really energy. And the energy equity such as Santos has hardly moved. Um, well, they moved a little bit, uh, but uh, you know there's a lot more to go. Certainly the um, you know the share price is not reflecting of what the underlying commodity has done um, and especially in the next few weeks when we do have uh, more news flow out of the um, you know the conflict in uh, in Europe um, you know potentially we'll have more volatility in those names and that should present really great opportunity for buying for investors. So are you also saying that if eventually peace breaks out in Ukraine 
commodity stocks will still do pretty well because then there will be more positive views on global growth going forward? Um, yes and no. So I think uh, when the news flow first break out, you'll see the commodity uh, stocks or share prices will, will actually fall. But then if you take a step back, a lot of sanctions that's been put in place are unlikely to be removed. So that means the tightness in commodity is not going to disappear uh, for any time soon. Um, and uh, so we should see these stocks really bounce back very quickly, but tactically it presents really good buying opportunity for investors. Okay. Now, Let's talk about, you've talked about the miners. Did you pick up any, any new tech stocks or add to your tech positions over the last few weeks? I uh, look at oh, uh, all, all the time. Uh, we, um, you know, tech, healthcare, all these names that we do like. Uh, so in terms of te tech, um, you know, we're buying more of the zero. Uh, we think the company is well positioned. So far, a lot of data out of UK on the SMEs are very strong. Federal budget, um, it is like beneficial for z uh, zero as well because the benefit for uh, instant write-off for the small businesses. And that's great for uh, generally, you know, a positive influence over the um, zero market. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so we think that company is well positioned, still sitting at $100, so how does it really die anything? We went to all the way to 150 so it right now presents good buy opportunity. Results coming up, we think, if anything, should present upside surprise. Um, and, um, you know, healthcare that we've been buying the last little while, um, you know, these, these are structural growth leaders. Uh, share price hasn't really done much, uh, being sold off unfairly as part of the growth companies. Um, and in the uncertain world looking ahead, um, you know, they present really good uh, quality quality uh, return or quality growth for anyone's portfolio. So these names we like, um, I can call it going all day, but uh, Seek is another one that's linked to, to the employment market. Um, share price hasn't really done much after stellar results. Um, and um, and then this employment market is going from strength to strength. Um, this company is going to deliver double digit return for a price that is, um, you know, never been cheaper. Great stuff. Jim Bailu, great to see you. See you in a couple of weeks time. Thank you so much. Well, alarmists out there think that a recession is a possibility. If that's the case, you, know, you wouldn't want to be in, in the stock market. On the other hand, a lot of people who I respect think it's still a good time to be in the stock market. I've got Paul Rickard of the Switch Report to talk about why there's recession talk around. Paul, what do you reckon? Well, sort of coming out of the US, Peter, and people get very excited. Uh, bond markets get excited when the curve inverts. So what that means is that the 10-year the bond rate is a fraction lower than the two-year bond rate. So if we, if we, if we had time, a 10-year one should be sort of higher. Yeah. And, lower, and that means the curve is positive. But when the short term is higher than the long term, then it's inverted or negative, and that says, oh, a recession. Well, people, coming. people get excited. So you're right. I mean, normally, you know, you, when people are borrowing, you yeah. know, there's a risk that whether you borrow for two years or 10 years, it's more risk. So you expect to pay more, which is sort of the positive yield curve. The yeah. inverted curve is obviously the opposite. It goes the other way, as you explained. Yeah. And that tends to happen when uh, short-term interest rates are going up quickly. And the market is saying, OK, these are going to slow the economy down Steer a bit. Steer the economy, yep. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so and people start to look forward. That probably means that inflation is going to come down and the bond market gets all excited and they start to buy long bonds. So, it, look, it's in the past, over you know, the last 100 years, it's been not necessarily a predictor of recessions, but certainly we've seen the inverted yield curve on a few occasions. Yeah. And so, because the US market is so big on statistics, right, everything relates to, yeah. you know, what happened. They, they, they just keep record after record. And of course, they, go, they look back and they say, every time the curve is inverted, yeah. it's been an 18 month sort of predictor of recession. So I say that's a bit of sort of, it's giving the market too much yeah. credit. Yeah, and and you know? in actual fact, these people are lying. You yeah. Because it, it, it does happen and, and it's, worth, it's noteworthy. But you've got to look at the actual circumstances. I always love Warren Buffett said that if you could buy stocks based on history, librarians would be the wor yeah. wealthiest people in the world. Words that have effect. And so what I guess we're saying here, Paul, is if they're wrong and the global economy gets better and better, then eventually long-term interest rates will go up because the economy is looking really good. But at the moment, there's some sort of scare factor that, 
interest rates are going to go up, it'll choke off the global economy and a recession will come. Yeah, and I look, as an ex-bond trader, you know, the bond market is not that smart, Peter. People aren't sitting there going, oh, we're going to have a recession coming up, we better make the curve inverse, right? Yeah. It's simply about the power of money, right? And that is that they're seeing that uh, with talk now that, that the Fed could raise interest rates by 10 times or 10 quarter percent increases, mm. gone up from seven to 10. We've had the first quarter, mm. there are six meetings to go. So they're now saying, you know, we'll get half percent in the next couple of meetings and it'll be two and a half percent by the year. Obviously the bond market's looking at that and saying, okay, well, if the Fed is raising rates to um, reduce inflation, mm. that's got to be a positive for for bond yields longer term. And that's why they've brought them down a touch. Mm. It's also why the short rates went up quickly because the market's accepting that. So okay. uh, it, it's, not a, it's not a predictor. If, or you read a lot of crap about this over the coming weeks, right? Yeah. But it's not a predictor. So it's it, simply the fact of people looking at the power of money yeah. and working out where they want to invest. And, and they're different. presuming that central banks are nincompoops, are going to raise interest yeah. rates and hurt the economy. Reserve bank, the central banks will be trying to avoid that. And they're also uh, ignoring the fact that maybe inflation could fall when the Ukraine war is over and the oil price falls. In a country like Australia, Paul, we've got the 22 cent a litre cut in the fuel price for six months. If the oil price falls as well, well, inflation is trying to really drop to very low levels. Yeah, and I think they're also forgetting about why inflation became a non-problem or a non-issue for, for the last couple of decades. Good point. And no one seems to talk about this, and I argue this quite strongly, Peter, it's just the power, it's the digitisation. Yeah. It's every single business in the globe suddenly worked out that there were new competitors around the corner, not yeah. just fintechs, but other people looking how to do things differently. And they, in many cases, they didn't have the power to raise prices. Mm. And that's why inflation stayed so, so low. Now, that force hasn't gone away. No. All, all that's happened is we've had a whole lot of disruption due, due, due to COVID, yep. right? We've had a whole lot of supply chain issues. Mm. And suddenly, some of the people, you know, have been forced to raise prices. Mm. And now it's been building on itself and the question mark, is it transitory or whatever it is? Mm. But I reckon the Fed, the central banks will get this under control. Mm. And that's why, you know, it, it doesn't mean we won't go back to an environment of strong growth and low inflation. I just yeah. think you've got to look at this for what it is. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can't ignore the digitization of power mm. and the disruption that causes. That, that force has not gone away. No. And, and I guess you'd put, it's fair to say that when the market fell from January down to um, into February, early March, that was when they probably were worried that too many interest rate rises might cause a, a big slowdown in the US or even a recession. But the last month or so, there's been a change in attitude, hasn't there, Paul? They've been buying the market. They have been buying the market, and we've been buying it hard here. That's why resource prices are where they are. I mean, it, the resource prices aren't there by accident, guys. No. They're, they're there because there is strong demand for commodities because the growth, growth situation yeah. is pretty good. And it's not just and the Ukraine war, because it was happening before the Ukraine war. It was happening before the Ukraine war. So yeah. we've got to get through that. I mean, I think that, um, look, I just think you just... Just take the stuff the way it goes. Watch the 10-year bond rate. I think that's really important. But just don't get too... You know, the shape of the curve is sort of one of those... It's one of those academic things, Peter, that there's going to be lots, thousands and thousands of words written on. Mm. And to be honest, it's really not that important. OK, I've got, to, I've got to throw this at you. I didn't prepare you for it. But last week you were saying that don't catch a falling knife with yeah. Magellan. It was around $14. And then had a really and good... And I've been spectacularly <laughs> wrong. <laughs> no, but it's had a really good week. It's come back a bit. But do you think maybe that falling knife is starting to hit, hit the yeah, you look, and, and ba rebound? It almost bottomed the day I said. I mean, I think there's a couple of things that have happened. Obviously, that the market suddenly decided that Magellan was too cheap. Yeah. Uh, and then today we've had the uh, announcement of um, what I describe as a pretty opportunistic um, sort of offer or indicative offer from from. Um, perpetual for perpetual Pendle. For Pendle. Yeah. You know, because fund managers have fallen collectively by, you know, they've all come down. You know, it's not just Magellan. Magellan's let it down, but yeah. the other Australian major fund managers in, in Pendle and, uh, you know, and Platinum and, and the... Um, Pinnacle. Pinnacle have all come down. Pinnacle was too high, but yeah. look, and so, you know, P uh, Perpetual's stuck an offer on the table and that's mm. helped Magellan today a little bit. So, mm. uh, look, I guess that's what happens when value materialises. Yeah. I'm not saying, I don't know where we've yet bottled on BT, but mm. certainly, sorry, on, uh, on Magellan. Magellan, but certainly you'd have to say the price action of yeah. the last week is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it and felt, I, look, I'm, I look terribly wrong today. No, yeah. uh, but it, it felt to me that there was a, a, a lot of, um, I think, smart money saying probably 14 was too low. They still have to do a lot to get into the 20s, but 
Yeah, it's probably an interesting area. And you said it was a falling knife, and it was a falling knife then, but eventually that knife hits the, the, the bottom and vibrates, and eventually someone pulls Look, it up and it goes out. And they might have some intel about BT's, uh, sorry, not BT, Magellan's performance. What I've said is buy Magellan when the performance turns around. Right, right, in the middle of April. Right? Yeah, and we'll get some new data out, and they might have some intel around just how Magellan's gone the last month. Right. And, uh, and so... Uh, you know, more knowledge about the portfolio. There might be some smart money that's coming, Peter, yeah. as you said. So the, we never said Magellan wasn't cheap. Yeah. We just said it was uh, it was still falling knife, and maybe the knife bottomed and it bounced. I don't yeah. know what knives do, but yeah. let's do, they do something <laughs> well, like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing is, I, I bumped into a, a fund manager yesterday. He pointed out that Chris McKay was a water polo player who I used to play against. He was a good, a good water polo player as well. So if he can throw a few goals from Magellan, it would be good for those people who had the guts to buy. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Peter. And that's the show for Monday. Don't forget, we're back on Thursday. And if you want more extensive analysis of stocks that you might want to consider to buy, become a subscriber to The Switzer Report. Go to switzerreport.com.au. Thanks for joining me. See you on Thursday.